Good evening. Thank you all for being here. On behalf of the Georgetown Institute of Politics and Public Service at the McCord School of Public Policy, I want to welcome everyone here and those watching online to the kickoff of the exit interview series, examining the policy and political record of the Obama administration. The Institute of Politics and Public Service, or GU Politics as we call it around here, is in its second year, founded as part of the vision that launched the McCord School in 2013. Our goals are simple to connect students directly with the political process and the people who run it, and engage you in conversations on how it can be done better. We couldn't think of a better way to have that conversation than by launching this series. As most of the political focus these days centers on campaign 2016, we believe it's important to have a national conversation on the record and lasting impact of this president and what the next president will inherit. Who better to lead this conversation than the people at the highest levels of government who shaped that record? And what better place to have it than right here at Georgetown? The series will focus on, as we know tonight, national security and foreign policy, criminal and social justice, the economy, healthcare reform, climate change, and the political culture here in Washington. The exit interviews will ask each speaker how they think President Obama will be remembered in their area, what they think the biggest successes and challenges were in this administration, what they hope to accomplish in their remaining time, and what advice they'll have for their successors. And they'll take your questions. We expect to conclude this series before Inauguration Day 2017, and at the end of this series, we'll publish the transcripts and create a video archive in what we believe will be the first oral history of the Obama administration. We're excited to get started. A couple of housekeeping notes. First, I want to thank Dean Ed Montgomery and the entire team at the McCord School for their support and their commitment to sharing our work with the entire university community. I want to thank the staff at GU Politics, without whom uh, none of this would be happening. I'd like to thank my alma mater, the School of Foreign Service, for being tremendous co-sponsors of tonight's event, and to Dean Joel Hellman for leading tonight's discussion. Uh, I see a good friend, White House Communications Director Jen Psaki here tonight. So I want to thank the Obama administration for being willing to engage in this important conversation about the past eight years and the future of our country. Now, to be clear, the series is not meant to be an infomercial for the Obama years. It's designed to be a robust conversation about its record from a variety of perspectives. That's why we also intend to follow each one of these events in the coming days and weeks with a counterpoint event to provide a different point of view. And we're happy to announce that the first counterpoint event to this one is scheduled for next Friday, September 23rd, featuring former Republican Congressman Mike Rogers, who served as chairman of the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, who will share his point of view. Our next inter exit interview is scheduled for October 13th on criminal and social justice with Attorney General Loretta Lynch, and we hope to soon announce the counterpoint for that one. We want you to be a part of this conversation both during and after the events. So find us on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, and on Snapchat at GU Politics. Use the hashtag TheExitInterview to offer your own thoughts throughout the series. And stay tuned for more events on campus featuring students and your reactions and reflections on this conversation. Finally, I want to acknowledge the GU Politics Student Advisory Board, 15 Georgetown students that help us shape our work for the next year. They don't get any credit for it, but they share the commitment to politics as a form of public service. I'd now like to invite one of those students, Gabriela Barrera, a sophomore in the School of Foreign Service from San Antonio, to come up and introduce tonight's speakers. Gabby? Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Gabriela Barrera, a sophomore in the School of Foreign Service and a member of the GU Politics Student Advisory Board. When I first arrived to Georgetown, one of the first events I ever went to was a GU Politics meet and greet with the new group of inaugural fellows, where I met Charlie Spees, who would later become my student strategy team leader. 
I remember getting to talk with Mr. Spees, and little did I know that GU politics would end up shaping my entire freshman experience. Now, as a student advisory board member, I can only hope to help provide that experience to my peers. And that's why it's my distinct pleasure and my honor this evening to be kicking off what's going to be truly a game-changing series, the exit interview. Our moderator for this evening is Dr. Joel Hellman, who became the dean of the Walsh School of Foreign Service in July of 2015, after working 25 years on some of the most complex issues of governance, conflict, and international developments. Prior to becoming the SFS dean, he served at the World Bank in many senior roles, including chief institutional economist, director of the Center for Conflict, Security, and Development in Nairobi, Kenya, and coordinator of the bank's response in Indonesia after the devastating Ase tsunami. As a scholar, Dean Hellman was a political science professor at Harvard University and at Columbia University. Our guest of honor this evening, Ambassador, Ambassador Susan E. Rice, graduated from Stanford University and received her master's and doctoral degree in philosophy from the University of Oxford. Under the Clinton administration, she served as a special assistant and senior director for African affairs at the National Security Council. From 2002 to 2009, Ambassador Rice worked as a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, focusing on US foreign policy, transnational security threats, and global development. In January 2009, Ambassador Rice was nominated by the Obama administration and later confirmed to the position of U.S. Permanent Representative to the United Nations. During her tenure as ambassador, she worked to defend universal values, advance U.S. interests across the globe, and provided a, a vital role in preventing the spread of nuclear proliferation and supporting life-saving interventions in places like Libya and the Ivory Coast. In July of 2013, Ambassador Rice assumed the role of the President's National Security Advisor, where she is responsible for the coordination of the administration's foreign policy, intelligence, and military efforts. Please join me in welcoming Dean Hellman and Ambassador Susan Rice. Well, thank you, Gabby. Welcome everyone here to Gaston Hall, and welcome to those who are following the event on our live stream. And most importantly, Ambassador Rice, welcome to Georgetown. Thank you so much. We're thrilled to have you it's here. Great to be back. Um, this is your exit interview. <laughs> the purpose of the exit interview really is to get uh, your thoughts um, on your tenure, um, on your legacy, your future um, thinking for the next um, occupants of the office, um, and also for um, the tremendous group of students who are here today who are eager to do things um, and follow in your lead and footsteps. Um, and I think what I'd like to do in starting the exit interview is actually start with the entry, the beginning. Um, I was actually watching uh, some video footage of you at the on the campaign trail um, when uh, you were with Barack Obama. And you were talking about the world, and you described it. You said, this is a technical term. We inherit an unprecedented series of messes. So what I'd like to do is if you could turn your thinking back to the beginning of the administration. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how you saw um, what you inherited? What were the, the problems, the top tier security threats, and others that you needed to address um, in your tenure? Well, it was a difficult time, uh, as many will recall. I think the overwhelming challenge was the global economy and the fact that uh, we were in the midst of the worst recession since the Great Depression. And that had uh, happened suddenly, and it, it had affected not only the livelihoods of, of most Americans, but it also affected uh, the rest of the international community and the rest of the global economy. And we had a big economic hole to dig out of. At the same time, we had roughly 100, 150,000 troops deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan in two hot conflicts, and a concern that the fight against al-Qaeda and 
the hardcore counterterrorism challenge had not been sufficiently attended to in Afghanistan and Pakistan as we were uh, weighted more towards Iraq at the time. Um, in addition, we had many of our critical relationships and alliances that had been strained, if not frayed, particularly by the decision to go into Iraq and the manner in which uh, that was done. So we had many, particularly of our traditional European allies, feeling um, less than uh, good about the relationship with the United States. Our Asian allies and partners were feeling uh, that our attention had turned elsewhere. So we had work to do in terms of repairing um, our alliances and partnerships and relationships around the world and reestablishing and reasserting a constructive version of American leadership. I was at the United Nations, as you pointed out, at the beginning of the administration, and I really felt firsthand um, the sense of many countries that the United States had gone into a go-it-alone mode rather than a, uh, a collective leadership mode, um, that we had shunned multilateralism and shunned collective decision-making and weren't as interested in the views or the contributions or the perspectives of, of other countries and other peoples. And so we had all of those things to tend to simultaneously. Um, and so there was a very full agenda at the beginning. Um, we spent a, a great deal of time, particularly around the principles table, which I now chair, but at the time I sat at as UN ambassador, um, on issues like how do we deal with Afghanistan? Uh, and ultimately the president made the decision that it was necessary, even as we were working to downsize um, our effort in Iraq, that it was necessary to surge uh, our effort for a period of time in Afghanistan. And even as we were dealing with these pressing challenges, even crises, um, at the same time, we had an affirmative agenda, as I like to call it, that we were very focused on trying to begin to address. So the Prague Agenda, for example, which, which is shorthand for the speech that the president gave in Prague uh, on his vision of a world without nuclear weapons was part of the affirmative agenda, and that led to the New START uh, treaty with Russia. It led to our work to try to deal with the Iranian nuclear threat. It led to the series of nuclear security summits that the president has been, that he initiated and then uh, hosted again uh, this past uh, spring. Every couple of years, we have had a series of gatherings at the summit level to try to secure, for lack of a better term, loose nuclear material mm -hmm. and prevent it from falling into the hands of terrorists. And we've made enormous progress on that over the course of the administration. But that's an example of the affirmative agenda that we were trying to uh, pursue. Um, and there are many other aspects to it on the development side, on climate, we could go down the list, but that we were intent on trying to initiate and lay a foundation for, um, even as we were dealing with these urgent challenges at the outset. Mm -hmm. And as the uh, administration progressed, as the time progressed, the nature of some of the security issues as well as the positive agenda changed. Surprises came up, crises came up. How would you sort of see the nature of the threats and the challenges that you dealt with? Um, how did they shift? than change over time? Well, I, I think in many ways. First of all, we were uh, very clear that, as I said, that we had to lay a foundation for some of the, uh, the, the things that would take more time than the, the first year or two, but that were very important. So for example, the work we did to try to strengthen and tighten the sanctions on Iran, such that we were able to test ultimately whether there was an opening for diplomacy. And the sanctions took uh, the better part of the first term. Uh, and into the, to the second term, we maintained and strengthened those sanctions, both uh, with the help of Congress as well as multilaterally. And we were testing for diplomatic openings. And ultimately, um, following the uh, election of President Rouhani in Iran, we were able to embark on a negotiation that led to the Iran deal to ensure that Iran has no pathway to a nuclear weapon. Similarly on climate, some may remember uh, the uh, Copenhagen summit in 2009, which President Obama attended. It was kind of a diplomatic melee, uh, you might say. And uh, he tells 
um, very funny stories about running from room to room, literally holding a laptop, trying to negotiate on the one hand with the Chinese and others who at the time were not very cooperative and were holed up with uh, other countries that were not in the mood to be cooperative and shuttling back and forth between them and others that were more aligned with our point of view. The work that we did at Copenhagen, even though at the time it felt very messy, mm -hmm. in fact laid the foundation for the work that we have done subsequently, including and, and very importantly with the Chinese, mm -hmm. to achieve the Paris Agreement. And, and now we hope very much this year to achieve its entry into force, uh, a, a large step towards which we took a couple weeks ago in China when the US and China were there to join together uh, and deposit their instruments uh, for the, the Paris Climate Agreement, accounting for 40% of, of global emissions. So we had all of these foundations to lay, uh, and yet uh, at the same time uh, having to deal with you know, what was a very pressing threat, for example, from Al-Qaeda at the time, emanating from Afghanistan and Pakistan. It took a lot of effort and sustained work, but obviously we have substantially degraded the leadership core of Al-Qaeda, including bin Laden, in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. But if you look at the counterterrorism challenge, for quite a while it became much more diffuse, and we were focused uh, not only on uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, even as that leadership strength diminished and their numbers diminished, but we had to worry about Al-Qaeda in, in Yemen, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, and uh, in West Africa, uh, AQIM. And then we've seen the, uh, you know, the rise of ISIL, which uh, is a different uh, beast, but uh, one nonetheless that is now um, very much present, as you know, in, Af in uh, Iraq and Syria, and where we have rolled back 50% of the territory that they once held just a few years ago, two years ago in uh, Iraq and about 25% in Afghanistan. But that's an example of how a, a proximate threat has morphed. Um, another, uh, I wouldn't put it in the same category, but another uh, challenge that has evolved is obviously the relationship with Russia, where uh, early in the administration with President Medvedev, we were able uh, to make some progress on things like New START uh, like uh, working together uh, in the early stages of, of sanctions on Iran. Um, and yet now that relationship has become ever more complicated um, by virtue of uh, Russia's role in Ukraine and taking uh, over territory from a sovereign country in violation of international law, the Syria challenge. Uh, and just generally speaking, uh, a, a more activist and difficult player in Russia that has um, raised concerns, particularly among our, our NATO allies, those uh, especially in closest proximity. So that's another example of uh, a challenge that's evolved. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to get a little further into some of those particular challenges that you, you describe. Um, in recent interviews, as President Obama looks back over his time, um, it was interesting when he was asked to describe what he thought was perhaps the, the dominant challenge that he faced. He used the term the problem of disorder, that sectarianism, tribalism, the erosion of state functions, um, and the multiple manifestations of that across different places was perhaps the, the, the dominant motif of what he had to respond to and think about um, how his uh, his presidency um, could respond in a reasoned um, and effective way um, in a set of problems that really were not as anticipated as deep as they were. Uh, how do you see this, the, the sense of the problem of disorder and how it sort of shaped the thinking of the president and the foreign policy team um, as they approach the... Well, I think you and I are both students of state fragility. Yeah. And uh, I think if you study uh, state fragility uh, around the world, you will see that you know, from Africa to Central Asia to South Asia, uh, even parts of Latin America, you, there have been for many years states that are, if not failed, uh, on the precipice of failure. 
What I think has been um, notable of late is that that phenomenon is now far more pronounced in the Middle East in the wake of Arab Spring. And um, you know, whether we're talking about Yemen or uh, Egypt or Tunisia or worst case, of course, Syria, uh, we're seeing to greater or lesser extents the challenge of the state maintaining not only sovereign control, Libya is an even worse example, um, but, um, but also the ability to govern effectively and deliver goods to citizens. And uh, at the same time, you've had the population challenging the legitimacy of the state mm -hmm. in, an, uh, in a rather unprecedented way. And so that has created in a very central uh, and significant region a degree of, uh, of disorder, to use that term, that we may have been accustomed to uh, managing in other regions, but here it was um, now uh, emerging in the wake of, of Arab Spring in a way and in a place uh, where our, um, some of our core interests were implicated. Mm -hmm. And is there an approach that you would describe about how the administration uh, handles this set of problems, not only in the Middle East, uh, we see it in South Sudan, we see it in other parts of the world, um, in terms of thinking about how to respond to these problems of disorder as they arise? Well, first of all, I'm, I would be the first to say there's no one-size-fits-all formula. Uh, and you can't apply solutions in a cookie-cutter fashion from one crisis to the next. And, uh, but I would say there's some principles we've tried to adhere to. First of all, when it comes to uh, the question of the uh, legitimacy of, of popular expression of discontent, we have taken the very strong view from uh, Tunisia to Libya to Egypt to Syria that there are universal principles and values that apply, that individuals have the right to assemble, to speak freely, to worship as they want, um, and to protest peacefully. And so the application of those universal values is, is one constant. And that's not just the case in the Middle East. It's, it's a philosophy that we try to, to bring to bear and, uh, make manifest in our dealings with various different countries. Secondly, we've learned and we've tried to um, implement strategies where possible of working by, with, and through partners. So uh, in, uh, in various conflict zones, particularly those that have a counterterrorism aspect to them, um, we have tried to limit to the extent possible, direct American military engagement on the ground and bring to bear our unique capabilities, which can be intelligence, it can be surveillance assets, it can be air assets, building a coalition. Um, but as we have in Iraq and Syria, as we've done in different ways at different times in Yemen and Somalia, uh, and more recently in Libya, um, we are trying to work with those on the ground who can be viable partners. In some cases, those are state actors, that's preferable, um, where the, the state still exists and coheres and can uh, uh, exercise some writ of security that we can reinforce. In other cases, in more difficult cases, we've had to work with non-state actors. Um, but our view is that at the end of the day, it is going to be the, those that live in and belong to a country that are going to have to sustain security gains. And as we have seen elsewhere, uh, when it is us, it is by definition finite uh, and potentially reversible if once we leave, the local partners are not able to fill the void and sustain it. So that's another example of a principle that we have tried to apply, not, to this, with, not with perfection and not uniformly everywhere, but uh, as, a, as a matter of philosophy, and the president laid this out um, pretty clearly in a speech he gave a couple years at West Point, uh, years ago, um, that's, um, that's another way we've tried to approach the challenge of disorder. Emphasizing the necessity of good governance and the relationship between governance and security. And also investing in economic development. Um, that's a, a vital uh, prerequisite for building state capacity. 
and making disorder into greater order. Um, and you, we know that, and you know that from the work you've done. Um, you, know, you need good governance, uh, or at least uh, well-intentioned governance <laughs> as a starting point, and you need some economic uh, traction that can give the state the resources to perform the functions that a state has to perform. Now, much of the response that you gave really talked about how you can work with partners, work with local institutions, build them up, give them the support, necess support necessary. Um, I wonder what you think the administration has learned and, and actually a message to pass on um, about the, the limits um, of American power. Um, in these kinds of very difficult situations and how one makes an impact but recognizing what limitations there are in American power to, to have an impact. Well, I think before I would convey to my successor a message about the limits, I'd convey to a, my successor a message about uh, the extraordinary um, capacity and importance of American power. I mean, if there's one thing that uh, we have seen reinforced time and time again. It's that we're, we face the most difficult problems, uh, whether it's building a coalition of 67 countries to deal with ISIL, uh, which is um, not only a threat, obviously, in, Afghan in Iraq and Syria, but in, in many other places, including South Asia, including uh, you know, parts of Africa, including uh, Yemen, elsewhere. Um, that's the U.S. leadership is essential. If you're trying to deal with a, a, an Ebola epidemic that threatens not only West Africa but many parts beyond, it falls to us to take the leadership role to build a global uh, effort to contain and ultimately stamp out something like that. And similarly, we're leading in trying to deal with uh, the Zika virus and could use a little more help from Congress to get that done. Uh, we built something called the Global Health Security Agenda, which we did before, we started before the Ebola uh, epidemic in 2014, where the idea was we've got countries around the world that have very weak health care systems and health infrastructure. And we saw that manifest in West Africa, but another example, we were just in Laos last week, uh, and parts of, of Southeast Asia and uh, in Asia and even Latin America have very weak health care infrastructure. And as a consequence, they are vulnerable when outbreaks arise because they may not be able to detect and contain them as quickly as we all need them to to prevent an epidemic from becoming a pandemic. So we organized 50 countries to implement this global health security agenda. And every leader that the President of the United States meets with, he's enlisting in the global health security challenge. And it's on the G20 agenda and the G7 agenda and the UN agenda um, through the WHO. So that's another example of how American leadership is essential. And similarly, you know, to organize and maintain uh, pressure on Russia for its actions in Ukraine. That was US leadership working with our European partners, even outside of a multilateral institution, um, to maintain the pressure of sanctions that have imposed some cost for its action in Crimea and Ukraine. So uh, the first message I'd convey is we lead, our leadership is demanded, it's required, and uh, we should embrace that. But that's not to say that there aren't some things that aren't amenable to U.S. leadership alone, or even U.S. leadership in a coalition context. And I think you know our experience and frankly that of previous administrations in places like Afghanistan and Iraq have underscored that, as I said earlier, that w while we might be able to play an extraordinary role in terms of surging security support uh, and surging economic assistance and uh, in diplomatic engagement, at the end of the day, it's not likely to be sustainable without the local authorities with the will and the capacity to carry it through. Um, and so in Afghanistan now, where we have roughly 10,000 troops as opposed to uh, uh, many, many more, um, we are in a training and advisory and assistance capacity. We're helping the Afghan National Security Forces, which we have built up over years, to be the lead in the fight. We're no longer in a combat role. We're in an advisory and assistance role. 
and in a counterterrorism role. And uh, you know, it's been long and imperfect, uh, but and and very costly for the Afghans as they've taken the brunt of the battle against the Taliban. But ultimately, it's they have to do that, or it's not going to be sustainable. And we, you know, we are trying in the same vein in Iraq this time to work with the Iraqi security forces, with the Kurdish forces, in a, a manner that that they hopefully can sustain. And in uh, Prime Minister Abadi, we have a partner who wants to work together to deal with ISIL. And how would you apply the lessons that you learned from Afghanistan, the lessons that you learned from Iraq to the Syria case, and thinking about America's leadership role in Syria? Syria is, in my estimation, one of the most difficult policy problems uh, that we've encountered, or certainly that I've encountered, not only in this administration, but in my experience in uh, the Clinton administration over eight years. And in my experience, frankly, as a, as a scholar of this uh, in the interim. And the reason for the complexity of it is because it is such a multifaceted conflict. It's a sectarian conflict. It's a, uh, a regional conflict. It's now a great power conflict with Russia having inserted itself. Um, it is a proxy war on some level. It is a, uh, it is a civil war with a very fragmented opposition. And like virtually any conflict of its sort, it's ultimately got to be resolved at the negotiating table. There isn't a clear-cut military solution. Assad will never be able to restore legitimacy uh, throughout the country. The opposition is probably never going to be strong enough to topple Assad. And so ultimately, this is going to have to come to a negotiated solution with a transitional arrangement agreed. And we've seen that for years. But in the meantime, everybody's doubling down. And the violence is horrific. And the outflow of people and refugees and the humanitarian toll is extraordinary. And so our leadership role, again, in, you know, in trying to uh, weigh the complexities here is, first and foremost, we have an obligation. And, and we are focused, first and foremost, on trying to deal with the threat from ISIL and, frankly, uh, the al-Qaeda elements that are also present in Syria, um, sometimes called al-Nusra, but it's al-Qaeda in Syria, um, that have the potential to pose a direct threat to the United States or our allies. That is the weight of our present effort uh, in Syria and Iraq. At the same time, we, have, we are the largest contributor of humanitarian assistance, like $5 billion. We're trying to also uh, help our European partners and others deal with the refugee outflow. We're trying to support Jordan and Lebanon and Turkey and others that have absorbed the consequences uh, of the Syria conflict. But above all, we're trying to get some traction to resolve it, which is the sort of prerequisite for success on all those other fronts, from the counterterrorism to the regional stability. And that necessitates, uh, however unsavory it may be, dealing with those players that, that have maximum influence, which is why we spent uh, a great deal of time trying to um, work with Russia, despite our tremendous difficulties and high level of distrust between us. Because if, and I underscore if, we can achieve a degree of calm that can be sustained and stop the bombing of, uh, of civilians, we can have the prospect of creating an environment where there's the potential for negotiations to gain some traction. Absent that, this is going to grind on longer. And that's what we're trying uh, to avoid, even if it's a, not a high probability gambit. Now, st stepping back, you said this was the biggest challenge. Would you put this hardest. as the hardest? hardest? What would you say is the biggest challenge? And since we're looking at the overview of the whole period, you your biggest today? success. Well, oh, what, your, what, what you will take away from your time in office as saying, my greatest achievement with the, uh, Pre President Obama's team is this, um, and the area in which I wish we would have achieved much more progress is blank. Well, on, on the achievement side, uh, if you'll indulge me, I mean, I think there are several things that, that we will look back on and, um, and feel like we have made a significant and lasting contribution. 
Um, in the realm of addressing the challenge of climate change, which we think is urgent and pressing, um, the leadership that the president exerted, um, the diplomacy we're able to uh, build with China, the fact that for years, again, like global health, but even to a greater extent, on every bilateral agenda we have, climate change is a staple issue. We've rallied the world to an agreement that uh, is not in itself sufficient, but is, has a potential to bend the curve in the direction that we all uh, need to, uh, to see it go. So that would be uh, one example. I, I'm particularly uh, proud of the effort that went into uh, work towards the Iran deal. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's got its share of critics, uh, but I challenge anyone to show a better way of ensuring that Iran does not have a pathway to a nuclear weapon. And the critics of the Iran deal aren't suggesting that the outcome is bad. They, they wanted something else uh, in terms of Iran policy as well. So, and, and the Iran deal was never meant to solve all of our problems with Iran. We still have great concerns about their role in the region, their support for terrorism, their threats to Israel, uh, their human rights abuses. But I'd rather an Iran that is bad without nuclear weapons than an Iran that's bad with nuclear weapons. And so I think that's an important contribution. Changing 50 years of failed policy towards Cuba uh, is another thing that I think uh, we will, I hope, as an, as an American public look back on and say was past time uh, and was necessary to do. Um, we have invested a great deal in, in things that don't get much attention that have been in the realm of, of global development, uh, that we, we were talking about state fragility and the risks that that poses. Um, and I was talking about the, the necessity of investing in the economic pillars of stability. Well, the work that uh, the president has led on uh, global food security uh, and ensuring that, that in many parts of the world where food insecurity was a huge source of fragility. We have built capacity and changed the trajectory uh, in many of the most vulnerable places in the, the food security space. Uh, Power Africa, which is an initiative to double the amount of uh, megawatts on the African continent, makes a difference between people being able to do homework at night and, and get an education. It also has enabled clean energy technologies to be far more readily available so that in developing places like Africa are not doing it the dirty way, the old way, uh, to the same extent th that we did. The president has a series of young leader uh, initiatives that have linked up leaders across Africa and Southeast Asia and Latin America and most recently Europe that have built networks and, and communities of government leaders, civil society leaders, business leaders that will be the next generation um, in their countries, and now they have a network that brings them together to share expertise. I think the value of that cannot be uh, overstated. And meanwhile, you know, the rebalance to Asia, which is the region where uh, the United States' uh, future lies in terms of both our economic future and our security uh, interests, has also, I think, been an important uh, and, and very significant uh, signature of President Obama's tenure. Um, and so I could go on. We've got to get TPP ratified. That remains an important piece of sure. unfinished business. But um, the rebalance is another thing that, that I would um, suggest is I could go on. But I know and the areas want... where you didn't achieve what you wanted well, to do, Sy Syria has been, as I said, an enormous challenge and frustration. And because of the extraordinary human costs of that, I think that, that weighs on. Um, all of us, uh, not because, at least from my vantage point, I think that we could have, would have done something differently and everything would have been different. I don't, actually, and we could spend time on that. But I do think that it, it's a, a difficult problem that, uh, that I wish had a, a cleaner solution that would come to fruition sooner. I'll, I'll give you another example of a, of a frustration on a, on a different scale, but nonetheless very real. We all invested a great deal of diplomacy and effort uh, and hope, frankly, in the birth of South Sudan five years ago. And uh, five years hence, it is back in the throes of 
virtual famine almost, civil conflict, economic collapse, be all because of venal leadership. And that is an enormous tragedy because the people of that country have suffered for so long, first under the yoke of a repressive regime in Khartoum, and now uh, because its own leaders have failed them. And you know, the United States will remain very committed to the people of South Sudan, and we're very much present trying to address the humanitarian challenge and broker and implement uh, a political solution. But that's a very real disappointment. Now, I'm going to take a group of questions from the students who lined up earlier and wrote some questions on uh, cards. Um, a student's going to bring me up. But while I'm getting the questions, I actually just also want to ask you if, you, if you had to sum up the eight years of the administration, if you're looking at the Obama years and trying to, to, to summarize a set of principles um, that, that came out of the engagement on global affairs, uh, both what you intended, what surprised you, what came out. How would you summarize this, uh, this period? Would, would there be an Obama doctrine? I know that Obama doesn't like saying that there's a set of principles that guide all his actions. But is there a kind of coherent frame that we, you would use to describe his approach to foreign policy? I'm very wary of doctrines. Yes, indeed. Uh, and not just because he is. I don't like him for my, my own reasons. But l let me try to summarize it this way. American leadership is indispensable, but many of the most uh, difficult and pressing problems we face internationally uh, are, by definition, the kinds of threats that aren't am amenable only to the exercise of American power. So whether you're talking about dealing with pandemics or climate change or terrorism or proliferation or any of the failed states, uh, these are challenges that can't be addressed through might alone or through one country alone. And so, therefore, while we must lead, we have to lead to the greatest extent part, uh, possible with others and to bring the resources, the capacity, uh, the legitimacy that other countries and, and uh, collective action uh, necessitates. And so, I think we have tried very hard to lead but to enlist at the same time, uh, enlist the capacity, the resources, the legitimacy of other partners. Um, and there's, a, as we've discussed, there's a rare challenge in the world that, that I can think of at the present that is simply a matter of the application of American power. Well, I've got a lot of questions here, as you can see, and we've got a limited time. Let me, um, uh, let me read some of them, and we'll start just one by one and see how many we can get through. Justin Plum from the college, the class of 19, asks, Do we get to see these people? Are they here? Can they, can they um, stand up when, we, when I name? If Justin's here, just so, so you can okay. see. Okay. Hi, Justin. <laughs> so it's better to see a face with a name. So Justin asks, what do you think will be the biggest foreign policy issue facing the next president that hasn't gotten much attention um, from the media or from the candidates? <laughs> uh. <laughs> well, I think the, uh, the next administration is going to face many of the same challenges that we're wrestling with now. Uh, there's no question that uh, the challenge uh, of ISIL and, and the counterterrorism challenge is, is going to endure. Uh, I think you know, our aim is to shrink the problem, um, but it's, it's not going to be gone. So that will remain um, a very serious one. Another, I think, is the, the cyber uh, security challenge, which does get a lot of attention inside the administration um, and perhaps through uh, other uh, corridors in Washington, but I'm not sure has gotten the degree of public attention uh, that the threat uh, necessitates. And it's a threat to our, our economic security. It's a threat to national security. Um, and it is a threat that may emanate from states or from non-state actors or from teenagers in their bedrooms. And uh, I think that will continue to rise as a significant challenge for subsequent administrations. 
Another one that, uh, frankly, I, you know, I pray does not uh, arise, but that I, frankly, worry about uh, rather significantly, and I think our successors should worry about, is the risk of pandemic disease. Um, I, I don't mean Ebola. Ebola, thankfully, was not a pandemic. But if ever we faced um, an avian flu that circled the globe in a, a rapid way, uh, that would be a very deadly potential uh, threat to people here and people around the world. We always uh, have to try to guard against uh, the combination of terrorism and weapons of mass destruction, which is why the president has worked so hard on the national, uh, on the nuclear security um, uh, agenda in trying to reduce the quantity of material that bad actors uh, could potentially lay their hands on. Um, so those are some examples. I think the other enduring challenges, the North Korea challenge will endure. Uh, and um, we need to also, for any incoming administration, be mindful that uh, those who may wish us ill may view the period of, of transition or the first months of a new administration as, I think, as customary as a potential point of vulnerability, where they might try to test uh, the limits of, of what they might get away with. And I think we're going to have to be mindful, uh, particularly in places where um, we are in close proximity to um, potential adversaries, that we manage that carefully. I've got a question from Kareem Maniudin from SFS Class of 20. Hi, hey, Kareem. Kareem. Um, Kareem asked about your role as national security advisor and asked in the age of social media, how has the increased global awareness of Americans around the world affected your duties and roles as a national security advisor? And I'd, I'd like to add and follow up also on your thinking about the role of national security advisor. When you think about perhaps advice again to your successor, um, is there a way in which you think that the role of national security advisor ought to change? There's been a lot of discussion about what the role entails, how effective is it be, and how can you make it more effective? Well, with respect to the impact of, of social media and the rapid, if not in, incessant, news cycle, um, it's, it's a very different universe and challenge than, uh, than I think my predecessors faced, say, 20 years ago when I was a junior staffer at the National Security Council. Um, back then, there were no iPhones where we were getting, you know, the news ticker every second, and there wasn't, you know, 24-7. There was CNN, but there wasn't every other cable station. Uh, and we carried pagers on our belts, and if the pager went off, you had to call the situation room, and then the situation room would read you some update on what's going on. It was completely different. And I think in that universe, there was, First of all, less demand for immediate reaction to whatever was the news of the moment. Um, there was more time and space for policy processes to, um, uh, to sift through the problem and, and the options. Um, and uh, things were, perhaps as a consequence of that change in, in how things are reported and digested, um, or maybe not as a consequence, maybe there's an independent variable, but less politicized. Uh, foreign policy was um, something that we debated, you know, in the halls of Washington and uh, on our home shores, but it didn't bleed over. Uh, and that seems like a cliche now, but it was, it was true. Um, and so it's a very different uh, environment, I think a faster paced one. Um, and uh, one where we all gather and consume and, and disseminate information through many, many different channels than we used to. And so, for example, uh, when I was at the United Nations, my uh, team said, you know, you really ought to get on Twitter. I'm like, what? I'm not, I don't want to make, I said this literally, I don't want to make foreign policy by haiku, which is, you know. <laughs> so, I was a reluctant adopter, initially, of, uh, of Twitter. But 
uh, I, I got into it, and now I got over 500,000 followers, and I see it as... <laughs> Sorry, I had to get that in. <laughs> Can you give us our Twitter handle, please? <laughs> At Ambassador Rice. <laughs> but, um, but now I do actually see the utility of it as a way to communicate in a, uh, an environment that is fast-paced and where people are digesting information in, in, in small bites. And it compels us to be able to communicate in a, a much more succinct way. Now, as for the role of National Security Advisor, um, you know, different uh, individuals who have held my seat have approached the job differently. Um, I think, you know, with greater or lesser profile, um, but I think the job itself is essentially the same. And I was talking with my colleagues about how best to characterize it. And I say it's like being the quarterback without the glory and the high pay. <laughs> <laughs> You, 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 you have to see the whole field. You have your star players who um, are on the team. But at, at the end of the day, you know, you're trying to run the plays and, and, and decide with the team uh, how best to you know, pick the plays and execute. And that's, uh, that's what we do, and that's what I try to do. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's a handoff, sometimes a pass, sometimes it's, you know, quarterback sneak. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the, the point is that we are a team. We are a national security team and we serve the president. And my own view of the role is very much informed by my tenure 20 years ago as an NSC staffer. I came in at the most junior level I then served at this, what they, we call the senior director level, which is sort of the assistant secretary level equivalent. But then it's also informed by the fact that I've worked uh, more than eight years in the State Department as an assistant secretary of state, and then uh, as, uh, as UN ambassador. So I've seen the NSC from inside, from top, from bottom, and from outside. And my strong view is it's a, a very uh, essential and central cog in the system, but that it, it needs to be right-sized such that it is playing the critical role of policy coordination um, and letting the agencies to the maximum extent uh, do their jobs and implement. And so you know, when I came in, every successive administration going back to uh, time and memorial has grown the size of the NSC. Um, I think it was 42% of the policy staff growth in Bush, uh, no, Cl Clinton, Bush, we, we were about 20%. And I um, believe I'm the first national security advisor to reduce the staff of the NSC. And we will be about 15% down from when we started this effort a couple of years ago. And I think that's right. I think you know it needs to be manageable. By the way, I do not think it should be legislated by Congress. I think. That is a mistake. <laughs> but I do think that future national security advisors um, should not fall into the comfortable uh, trap of growth for growth's sake. And because most of the uh, NSC staff are detailed from other agencies, um, it, it's not very hard from a budgetary point of view to allow staff to grow. And so we've tried to not only just downsize, but also to right size. And there are places where we were underweighted, places where I thought we were overweighted. Uh, and we have tried to, con to join the, the, the right sizing with some ways of doing, different, doing business differently that we hope are more effective, less onerous on ourselves and on the agencies, um, and that uh, send the message to the agencies that they're the frontline implementers uh, and uh, activists when it comes to policymaking. Well, there are a lot of potential national security advisors in this audience um, and a future um, uh, hopeful diplomats. And in fact, one of them, Robert Klepper, is here. Um, where's Robert? And Robert asks. Stand up. Let me see you. All right. 
Um, Robert asks, as a former diplomat, what advice can you give to us students who would love to pursue an internationally focused career on how to best take advantage of our time at Georgetown to prepare for this kind of career and life path? Okay, that's a great question. Um, first of all, get out as much as you can. Um, get not just out of the halls of Georgetown and not just around Washington, but while you're in college, while you're in graduate school, if you go to graduate school, and while you're still young and relatively unencumbered, I think it's really, really important to see as much of the world as you possibly can. Um, if I have two regrets about my own professional development, one is that I wish I had joined the Peace Corps uh, at an early age, and I, I mean, I don't regret what I did, but I wish I had had the opportunity to do that because I think that's very valuable training. And I don't, I don't get paid by Peace Corps. Uh, <laughs> this is not a paid advertisement, but it's really what I believe. And the other is, you know, I, uh, I grew up here and studied Latin uh, in high school, and I took the Latin AP, and I could, I could translate the hell out of Horace and Catullus. There's several places here. <laughs> <laughs> But that wasn't altogether useful. <laughs> uh, it's great in this room. <laughs> I took some Spanish in college, uh, but I didn't have the opportunity to, um, to live and be steeped in a foreign language environment. And I wish I had that, because while I can understand and get by a bit, um, and the Latin helps with understanding the Romance languages, it's not very good for communicating. So I really think the language skills, the experience abroad, um, and living, frankly, living rough while you're young is a very important way to gain a feel for uh, and an appreciation for the complexity of the world that you're coming into, uh, the challenges that people who live in less privileged contexts are facing, and I think it will make you a better policymaker and diplomat as a consequence. Well, Robert notes here that he and several hundred, several hundred other people in the audience are available for internships, um, <laughs> job profiles, and anything I'm else. I'm going to collect all your resumes <laughs> and pass them on to my successor. At the door, please. Successor. Drop. Well, we, we have come to the end of the time we have, um, and we really do appreciate you spending so much time with us on our first exit interview. Um, I want to acknowledge um, a few people first. Um, and talk a little bit about what's going to happen after this. First, I want to acknowledge the Institute of Politics and Public Service um, at the McCord School of Public Policy um, for hosting this exit interview series. You're the first of this series, and it's a wonderful... I, hope I haven't messed it up. No, not at all. It's a wonderful <laughs> opportunity for us to really gain insights um, into your time in government. I want to acknowledge um, Dean Ed Montgomery, um, the Executive Director, um, Mo um, Alady, um, for their leadership. Um, I also want to let you know, um, and the students here know, that as part of a counterpart conversation to these exit interviews, we're going to provide um, an alternative perspective um, on national security and, uh, and foreign policy with former Republican Congressman Mike Rogers, um, the chair of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Um, and that date is Friday, September 23rd. And we're also going to invite students to be part of this conversation. So I hope you students will stay tuned for more events to continue and engage um, in this conversation and this six-part series of exit interviews. But most importantly, I want to thank you, Ambassador Rice, um, for taking out time of a, of a very, very busy schedule to come spend some time with us. Give us your views and insights. We really appreciate it. And we're um, very happy to welcome you back you here to Georgetown. It's been great. Thank you, guys.